Hi, this is Miss Litton, and we are. Oh, and I need to record here. Sorry. Uno momento. Hi, this is Miss Litton, and this is AP Biology, and we are reviewing population genetics and discussing how populations evolve. Say hi. Hi. All right. Um, is can somebody check to make sure it's going? It's going fine. Okay. Thank you. Just tell me. I don't know if is that the right angle, or is it better here? Let's check you out. Okay. Oh, that's so weird. I don't want to look at me. Is that better? Is that better on the screen? Tell me, I don't know. Sorry, we're weird. Or I'm weird. They're not weird. I'm weird. All right. So, um, okay. So, first thing we want to talk about is um, we, when we talk about how we need to remember that it's populations that evolve, not individuals, right? Are you like watching in two places now? You're going to weird me out. Um, <laughs> So one example of where we've seen a population evolve, and that is bacteria, and that's through artificial selection, right? Because what's man doing? It's putting too many antibiotics out there, and it's making the, we're killing off which type of bacteria? The weak ones, and which ones are surviving? The strong ones are surviving, and that's what we're selecting for. Okay, so when we talk about populations, we want to look at all of the alleles within that population. And what we talked about is if the allele frequency changes, then what is occurring? Evolution, okay? What if it only changes a little bit and so there's still interbreeding going on? Microevolution, okay? So microevolution is changed within a population. It's still changed. The allele frequency is changing. For instance, as uh, people, we've gotten taller and taller and taller. But it's not like only tall people reproduce with other tall people and short people reproduce with other short people, right? So that's not a factor in whether you're going to survive or not. So that's still within a population. Oh, you're making comments? <laughs> people can make comments? Yeah. Oh, okay. It's a chat? It's a oh, I had no idea. Oh, it's, so it's TikTok-ish that way. Yeah. Okay, sorry. So you could ask me a question, and I could go, oh, do you want me to answer that? But somebody would have to monitor it, because I'm not. OK, and ma sorry, macroevolution is when you have a whole new species. So the first thing we need to make sure we understand is the difference between a genotype and a gene pool. What is the difference between a genotype and a gene pool? Can you turn next to the person you're sitting next to and differentiate in your own words, I yow it, the difference between a genotype and a gene pool? I can't monitor that. So a genotype is one, could be one person's two alleles, but a, a gene pool is the entire population's two alleles and diploid organisms thrown in together. Okay, so come back to me. Any idea, to how, can somebody differentiate between genotype and gene pool? So the genotype, nice and loud. So the genotype is like the specific allele for that one organism. And yes. Gene pool is going to be all of them. Oh, like yeah, the entire, exactly. Did you hear what he said? A genotype is one individual's two alleles, right? We're diploid. The gene pool is where the entire population has all of their alleles put in. And we then measure the frequency. We will only have a dominant recessive trait because that will be easier to do with Hardy-Weinberg, right? And so when we look at these equations right here, okay, these two equations, this is where I get fearful that you might make a mistake. It's just differentiating between when you're looking at the population when you're looking at the gene pool. So when you look at an entire population, you only need to know how many homozygous recessives you have, right? Or how many show the dominant trait because both of these genotypes would show the what? Dominant trait. So there's only this genotype that would show the what? Recessive trait. So if you're given a population of 1,000 and 700 of them show the dominant trait, what your mind is going to ultimately go to right away is, oh, 700 show the dominant trait. What I really care about is what? Recessive. The recessive. So what would that be? 
700 showed the dominant trait in a population of 1,000. 300. 300, good. 300 would show the recessive trait. Does that make sense to you? And that's what you have to work off of because then you can take 300 divided by 1,000, right? And you have the Q squared percentage. From that, you can solve for Q, right? If you take the square root of Q squared, you solve for Q. Once you have Q, you can solve for P, right? Once you have P and Q, you could then tell me P squared, and you could also tell me 2PQ, right? What you would expect in the population, okay? And when we talk about evolution occurring, it's these values right here. If P and Q change, then evolution has occurred. So when we looked at that, um, let's do a practice one right now in the classroom real quick with the grouping that's here, okay? And so having blue eyes is a recessive trait. If we look around the room right now, let's see how many people we have in the room. Double check me in case I'm wrong. I see two, four, six, eight, 10, two, four, six, eight, 10, two, four, six, eight, 10 is 30. 34 individuals in this room, yes? Mm -hmm. Okay, 34 individuals in the room. Now, how many of you have blue eyes? Blue-eyed people, please stand up. Please stand up. <laughs> it's AP. Okay, all my blue-eyed children, wait, keep standing up. Seriously? It's Till and I are the only ones that have blue eyes? All right, all right. You should be able to go from that. You should be able to tell me, listen to me carefully, only two of us have blue eyes. Only two of us have blue eyes. I think there's some founder's effect going on there. Two blue-eyed people. From that, I want to know everything. I want to know the allele frequency of P and Q, and I want to know what, how many of you are probably homozygous dominant for brown or dark colored eyes, and how many of you are heterozygous. Okay, so work that out. At home, you want to work this out too. Okay, so I'm going to talk softly so I don't give the answer away. So the blue-eyed trait is recessive, and that's always going to be the Q squared part. So we have two equations, right? We have P plus Q equals 1, and we have P squared plus 2PQ plus Q squared equals 1. So when I talk about how many of you have blue eyes, if that's the recessive trait, which part of this, these two equations do you think I'm referencing? Hopefully, okay, you said Q squared right here, right? And so our Q squared value, our Q squared value is going to be equal to the two blue-eyed people divided by 34. Okay, so let me check. Did you get it at least this far? that that would be the Q squared value, right? So I would take 2 divided by 34, and what did you get that to be? 0 0.05882, okay? So Q squared here equals 0 0.05, let's say 9, okay? I'm just, it is 88. Then what do you need to do to solve for Q? Take the square root. So the next thing you're going to do is you're going to square, take the square root of that. So when you got the square root of it, what did you get? 0.24. So now you know Q equals 0.24. Okay, then I'm going to let you keep working for a little bit. So now that you know Q is equal to 0.24, we're going to deal with this equation right here. So then you would have to figure out what is P because if you look at your entire gene pool, you're either going to be P or Q. Oh, good job, Kayla. <laughs> okay. Um, so it's either going to be P or Q. So all you have to do is say 1 minus 0.24. <laughs> and what would that be? What did you guys get for P? 0.76. 0.76, right? Because, right? Because you know P plus Q equals 1. So what would P have to be if Q is 0.24, right? So P is what? 0.76. Okay, I got to get a new page because it's too messy for me. So P equals 0.76 and Q equals 0.24. Now, how many people are in this room again? 
34 people in the room. So I want to know how many of those 34 from those values would you predict are homozygous for their dark eyes, heterozygous for their dark eyes. We already know how many are homozygous recessive. That's Till and Miss Litton, so that's two. So now you figure out the other two numbers. Okay, so then this is when you're looking at the genotype. So then you're going to be using your, this would be your P squared, right? Plus 2PQ plus Q squared, right? Which equals 2. Right? So then you just have to solve for these other. This is the only thing we have as far as possibilities. Because homozygous dominant would be P and P, right? Okay, so how many individuals did you get were would be P squared? What did you do? You took point what? Well, you did 0.76 times what? 0.76 times 0.76, and then you took that and multiplied it by how many? 34 people in the room. Yes. Yeah, 19.6. So we would say 20 people probably are um, homozygous dominant. We're just predicting. We don't know for sure, right? We're predicting just based on how many blue-eyed people we have in the room and assuming we're in Hardy-Weinberg Hardy equilibrium. So we have 20, we have 2, so that's 22. How many are left? Yeah, 12. And then do the math and see if that plays out. So do 2 times, right, 0 0.6, 76 times 0.24 times 34 people in the room. Is that what you got? Okay. All right. So, if you are given, if you start, okay, with a population and you know how many express the recessive trait, which you could calculate, right, then you have everything. All you got to do is say, oh, that percentage square rooted, I got Q. Once I have Q, you solve for P. Then you have the keys to the kingdom. You can do all the rest. Now, if they start off, if they give you a practice question or they give you a question, they say, P is equal to 0.38. P is equal to 0.38. Right? I would like to know in a population of 720 penguins, how many of those penguins express probably homozygous dominant trait, the heterozygous trait, and the homozygous recessive trait? Could you do that? Okay, do it for me right now. I see you, Prisha. <laughs> okay. Okay, so you know P plus Q equals 1. So all you would do is take 1 minus 0.38, right? So you just want a calculator, 1 minus 0.38, okay? And then that tells you that Q is going to be 0.62. <coughs> Did you get this for Q? Yes. Okay. Because you know P plus Q has to equal 1, right? That's, that's what we did there. So then you just need to do your, not that, sorry. Are you back? One second. So then you just need to do your P squared, right, would be 0 0.38 times 0 0.38 times how many penguins? 720. Right? Is that what you did? What did you get? 104? Is that what you got? Yeah. So 104 would be homozygous dominant. Okay. And then for your heterozygotes, what's that going to be? 2PQ, right? So now you're going to be 0.38 times 0.62 times what? 2 times 720. Okay, so how many did you get? That's what I got too, 339. Right? So, sorry, 339 
equals the hetero. Now, if you went wrong, I'm betting you forgot to put the two in front of the P and the Q, right? It's two PQ. So don't forget that part. Because remember, they could, the, the whole point of the, of the um, two PQ, so you don't forget, is in the gene pool, you could pull a P and a Q, or you could pull a Q and a P, right? So that's why we say two PQ. Those are the two different ways. You get the dominant recessive or the recessive dominant. Okay, and then how many did you get? What would you do to get the um, homozygous recessive trait? What would you do? Yeah, I would do 0.62 times 0.62, and then I would multiply that times 720. What did you get? 277, I agree. All right. Now, can you check with the person next to you and see if they're rock solid on this? I'm going to give you three more practice problems at the end so we can check. Okay, is there, come back to me, please. Is there anything you want to ask me about that? Any questions that you have? No? Okay, then I'm going to move on. So, I'm looking for something like, oh, there it is. I want to remind you, when you look at those allele frequencies, if they change, then you know what has occurred. Evolution. evolution. If you're still interbreeding, then what kind of evolution has happened? Microevolution. Okay? And then if it goes to a whole new species and they don't interbreed anymore, then we know it's macroevolution. So then we talked about what are things that would cause the allele frequencies to change. And that's when we use our five fingers, right? There are five things that could cause allele frequencies to change. So let's go over those five first, okay? So what was the pinky? Small populations. Small populations. Because small populations are more susceptible to what? Chance, but what do we call that? Genetic, Genetic drift. drift. Good. Okay, and I'll review that. Then what was the ring finger? Non-random non non mating. So you're selecting who you want to mate with. What was the middle finger? Mutations. mutations. Can we ever stop mutations? No. What was the pointer finger? Gene, Gene flow. flow. So immigration and emigration of alleles. And then what was the thumb? Natural selection. Good. Okay. So then that's why we went to... We talked about the Hardy-Weinberg law. It says if you can freeze the allele frequencies, then you can prevent evolution from occurring. The whole point of that, people get frustrated because they said you can't do that. Yes, that is the point. You can't do that. So since you can't freeze allele frequencies, it shows you mathematically that what is going to occur? Evolution. evolution. Okay? And so we talked about that... Uh, mutations, those are going to happen. You can't prevent a mutation, so that can change your allele frequency. You cannot, um, you cannot prevent gene flow. New genes could come in. Now, I mean, there are ways. What, are, what would be a way to prevent gene flow? I mean, that's a possibility of one you could meet. What? I can't hear you. Oh, yeah, if you had reproductive isolation, you could have geographic barriers, right? Anything like that that prevents gene flow. So that, that's one you could potentially meet, right? Um, we said you always need to have a large population because if you have a small population, you're prone to genetic drift. Um, we said that you always need to mate randomly. Do some organisms innately mate randomly? Yeah. Yeah. Polo worms put all their sperm out in the water, all their eggs out in the water. It is absolutely random. So that is one you might be able to meet. And then we said no selection, where no one individual is better than another individual. And that might be very difficult to do. So as a result of that, evolution does occur. Now, one example that's studied is industrial melanism. Now, I'm just showing you this first picture. Turn toward your bio buddy. See if you can explain industrial melanism. Go ahead. And then throw your calculator on the ground. Okay, come back to me. 
pre-industrial revolution, pre-industrial revolution, no soot on the trees. You can see there are two moths here, a light colored one and a dark colored one. They interbreed, they are one population, okay? Who's most likely to get eaten by a bird? Black yeah, the black one. So the frequency of the black allele is gonna go down and the white allele is gonna go up, right? As a result of that. But then post-industrial revolution, all this soot is all over the trees. So now the better adaptation is to be what? The dark, right? The black moth, that's a better adaptation because what changed? The environment changed. So because the environment changed, what was adaptive changed? Are you writing weird things? You are. Okay. So that is an example of what? Micro or macro evolution? Microevolution. Good job. All right. So I want to touch base on genetic drift, okay? Because we already went over the other ones. But genetic drift is chance. When you have a smaller population, if you have a population of 10, okay, and a log falls on them, okay, you might wipe out half your population. I believe you have an additional objective on this, do you not? Not on a log. But did you do your additional objective yet? I'll take by your silence that you did not. I recommend that you do that because it is on your quiz, right? So make sure you do your additional objective. Oh, yeah, sorry. In honors, it's additional objectives. My bad. Hi, did you do your highly suggested reading and thinking? Okay, then. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Like, don't accuse me of not doing my work. Um, so did you... Did you, did something happen on an island? Okay, that's all I'm saying there. So you're gonna make sure that you do it, right? So a smaller population is more susceptible to chance having a huge impact on their gene pool, right? And wiping them out, not because they weren't adaptive, but just because chance happened to wipe them out. If you have a larger population and you have an event occur, it may not wipe out as large of, um, as many uh, alleles. So we looked at two examples of genetic drift. One was a bottleneck effect. Let's say there is the plague and it goes through and it wipes out a bunch of the population. And then as a result of that, only a few alleles get through. In this example with the frogs, I told you a tree fell on the brown frogs. It wasn't because the brown were less adaptive. They just happened to be together. So that wiped them out. If you had a larger population of frogs, if you had a population of a thousand frogs and a tree fell on three of them, do you think it's gonna wipe out the brown allele? No. Okay, so that's why one of the conditions for maintaining Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium is always having a large population. Okay, a second form of genetic drift is founder's effect. And that's when you take a small portion of the population to start a new population. And it may not be representative of the entire population. I do not think that if you, what was the frequency of blue eyes in this classroom? <laughs> Yeah, it was pretty small. Do you think that's for the whole rest of the campus? No. So you are not good indicators of representing the entire population on campus because so few of you had blue eyes. Okay, so that, the one for founder's effect, the authentic example is the Amish. And when they were esca escaping religious persecution, there was a six-fingered dwarf on the boat. So that six-fingered dwarf was available for <laughs> for reproduction because the Amish would not they'd want to breed within their collective right and so maybe there was a higher percentage of six fingered dwarves I'm leaving that alone anyway that's founders <coughs> effect all right um, we looked at this cartoon so nobody seems to be interested in this red deer why doesn't anyone love me and then there's a fire, it wipes out a whole bunch of the population. And then look, we're the last two, yay. Now they're the ones that are reproducing. Which form of genetic drift is that? Bottleneck, bottleneck effect, because there was some disaster. So that'd be a bottleneck. I'm not making any comments about um, red. Okay, you also, inbreeding is also part of your um, highly suggested reading and thinking. So make sure you study that. Okay, and then we said, it's funny because they're lions, non-random mating. Uh, you know, non-random mating 
is purposeful, and that could be connected then to natural selection, right, of what's going to survive. All right. Um, okay, we're good on that. Then um, anything on Hardy Weinberg that you want me to review, again, I have three more practice problems for you to do at the end. I just want to make sure we get through all the content. Are we good? So then we started going into the types of selection, and you want to be able to differentiate between those types. Before you even talk about them, turn towards your bio buddy and see how many types of selection you can come up with right now. Josh, what are you writing? Stay focused. This is one of your distractors. Okay. All right. So what is the one where the norm is valued? The norm is valued. What's that one? Stabilizing selection. Would stabilizing selection lead to speciation? No. Okay, because you're, you're maintaining the status quo and you're selecting against the extremes. What is it when both extremes are selected for? Disruptive. So disruptive, here, when both extremes are selected for, could that lead to speciation? Yes, because yes, you could have new species from that. Okay, what is it when one um, extreme is selected for? Directional, there we go, directional. And we saw that with the horse getting larger and larger. And again, what changed that made the horse change in size over time? The environment changed. The environment changed, so what was adaptive change? Okay, so those were three forms of selection. And then we started talking about sexual selection, right? About boys and girls. And if they look different, that's called sexual what? Dimorphism. One thing we noticed in sexual, just a minute, are you here with me? Because it doesn't seem, you can go if you need to. Okay. So in sexual dimorphism, we noticed who looks brighter and more colorful? Males. Males, okay. Why are the males so colorful? What is their agenda? Attract the females. Okay, so that explains why they have their pretty colors. Okay, but why is the female so plain? Okay, did I heard survival because she's trying to what? Camouflage or hide when she's on the eggs, right? That's why. And also, does she have to be pretty? No. No, why? She's doing the choosing, right? That is true. Okay, if the females are choosing, that is not always true. Sometimes you're stuck with what you get, okay? And we'll talk about that in just a minute. But if the females are choosing, there's two genes. Um, not it. One of you explain one and one of you explain the other. So the good gene hypothesis is kind of like, in human terms, that would be like if somebody had a lot of money. So that's why you went after him because he, you knew he could protect you and take care of you. It would be considered the strongest. The runaway hypothesis is about um, how they look, like a peacock would be an example of that, that they're brightly colored, and in human terms, this would be if they were really good looking. Okay, which one is the good looking one? Runaway hypothesis. And, we, but we debated that because we said he could be brightly colored, which could also mean he's very what? healthy right and he's strong because he, you know other animals would see him more readily and he must be able to run away from them so we looked at those two okay um also we looked at what else do i want to oh i want to go here okay the diff not it the difference between intersexual and intrasexual go okay so Intrasexual, intra means within. So this is when males are fighting with males in order to compete to inseminate. Intersexual would be when a female is choosing a male, which one she wants to reproduce with. All right. So when we talk about female choice, 
Which selection are we looking at for female choice? Inter Intersexual selection. Intrasexual selection is males fighting with other males. And when that occurs, it could be that whoever is the alpha male, then that's who the females are going to reproduce with, that they don't have a choice. Remember, two different agendas, right? Who makes the most gametes? Males, by far. So they're competing to inseminate. Females have fewer eggs, and they're vulnerable when they have those, so they're going to be more choosy, hopefully. Be choosy. Um, so you will have male competitions. You'll have dominance hierarchies. The upside of the dominance hierarchy is you're probably getting more sex. Um, the downsize is you've got a target on your back because you're going to have ones within your population probably trying to fight you in order to be the one who inseminates more or an outside group coming in and trying to fight you to take over your group of females. Um, we said you could mark those territories with urine, with secretions from your eye, with calls, um, different ways to mark your territory. Okay, and then we said um, about variations. How could you maintain variations? And we talked about, this we have already talked about. How could you get variety? You could get a what? Mutation, right? You could have gene flow could give variety, and then you have selection could give variety as well. So these are how you could get maybe new traits brought in. Um, we talked about um, like your ingredients, what you're, how you're going to evolve through the process of evolution. You can only work with what you have, like ingredients in your kitchen. Um, I probably said you could make lobster bisque if you don't have any lobster in the house, right? So we can't evolve into something that we don't have the DNA even coding for. There's lots of imperfections in it because we evolved from a creature that walked on all what? Fours. So even though we are upright now, we have trouble with our backs. And then it's good in the subpopulations, that's variety. I'm looking at subpopulations within this group, right? Not only are we homo sapiens sapiens, but there are subpopulations. You're, we're all different colors, we have all different kinds of hair, and that's going to keep the variety within our population. We also noted on genotypic frequencies that you could never completely eliminate what? A deleterious recessive allele, right? Because it will always be maintained where? In the heterozygote. It doesn't matter if you're, this would be what letter here? If I say allele little a, what would that be? What letter in our Hardy Weinbergness? Q. Q, it would be Q. So it doesn't matter if Q is 0.9 or Q is 0.1, the heterozygote number will be the same, right? The heterozygote will still be 2PQ. It doesn't matter if one's bigger than the other. And so remember, um, natural selection can only work on those traits that are expressed. And if it's hidden in the heterozygote, you can't select against it. And in fact, sometimes the numbers will be maintained at a higher level because of heterozygous superiority. That the heterozygous is selected for. It's actually better. And we looked at that with a sickle cell. And we said, well, if you are homozygous for sickle cell disease, you're probably going to die of that. Um, if you're homozygous, no sickle cell, normal, you could die of malaria. But if you're a heterozygote, you're more resistant to malaria. Is this all over the world? Is this true? No, it's only true for those areas where their environment says you could get what? Malaria. Okay, that's the only place where it would be selected for. So that would not be universal. Just like when we talked about red hair. Where would be a good place to have red hair? Not like on top of your head, I got that. But I mean on the world, what? Yeah, and the higher elevations, the northern climate, right? Where they have less access to the sun, right? And so they want to absorb more of those pigments right? If you don't have the melanin in your body and you're living at the equator, you're not going to see a lot of red-haired people at the equator because that could lead to more um, skin cancer and decrease in fertility, okay? So your environment is going to determine where you're best adapted, okay? That is it. I have three practice problems for you to try. Yes? I the computer. Oh, I mean, whoops. Close. Um, okay. Thank you. All right. So here's your first practice problem. Mm -hmm. 
And at home, you may want to pause it for a second so you can do it. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm gonna... Okay, and here is your second practice problem. Again, if you're at home, I would pause it because I'm going to turn this off in a minute to allow people time to do it. Unless you need, do you need me to model how to solve these problems? And here is your third practice problem. Okay, avert your eyes because I'm going to give the answer. So avert your eyes so you want to be able to test yourself because I'm going to give you the answer. So pause and work those problems. Don't look at the answers yet because I am going to show them to you. Ready? Three, two, one. Okay, and there are the answers. Okay. So go do your practice problems. I hope that was helpful. Do you guys need me to show you how to work out these problems on here? We good? Okay. All right. What? Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right. So study. You have the answers. Hopefully you're going to do a great job. Okay. All right.